A battle can happen anywhere. They can happen in jungles, in swamps, in the snow, in the mountains, in the deserts. They can happen anywhere. Each environment requires specialized training and tools for a fighting force to be able to, well, fight. The same applies to most fiction, really. In Star Wars, you have different kinds of stormtroopers for different environments. And in Battletech, there are all kinds of infantry types you can use. There's mountaineers to fight in the mountains, space marines to fight in zero G, and submersible mechanized infantry to fight underwater. And I totally knew these existed without having to look up at Sarna. Totally. But this is Battletech. Mechs are the biggest thing here. Mechs are what people are here for. Most people what, what what most people are here for. There are some people who are there. I don't know. No, I'm I'm sure there's like some people who use infantry and uh, tanks more than mechs, but uh, I would say 90% more than 90% of people play battle type for the mechs. <laughs> but anyway, mechs tend to be universal, you know. But you know, there are some that are more suited for certain conditions compared to others. There are specialized mechs like the UMU equipped ones or underwater maneuvering unit mechs to that you use underwater. Those exist. Yeah, I could I could look into that. <laughs> Or mechs that were designed for a very specific type of environment, like the one we're here to look at, the Urban Mech, or Urbi. The first Star League wanted a cheap light mech that they could use to defend the many cities across the entire region of known human space, really. There are so many cities and so many planets out there that they need something cheap and somewhat simple and effective that they could just churn out out of the factory lines just like that. Now, they could have used an already existing design with a modified loadout something. You know, maybe like a WAPS with something. <laughs> <laughs> and there were probably other unheard or unseen new models that were offered by some companies. But when the Star League saw what Orgus Industries offered, they couldn't say no. I mean, how could you? Look at it! The Urban Mag is primarily designed for defensive roles. Its 30-ton Republic R-frame is covered with 6 tons of Duralex medium armor, which actually puts it on par with some lighter mediums. But the medium class armor does come at a cost. This thing is slow. The Linux 60 engine is only capable of pushing the mech to a top speed of 32 kilometers. That's literally the walking speed of basically every other mech out there. Two pit band 6000 jump jets help the mobility somewhat, but it can only jump 60 meters. But, you know, you have to keep in mind that this mech is designed for city fighting, where, you know, there isn't much space to run around anyway. But I feel like still having a lot of speed and a lot of jump, jumping distance also still helps, you know. Anyway, it has 11 single heat sinks standard, and its communication and targeting systems are both from the same company, Dalban. And they are the Interact and Urban. Judging by the targeting system's name, the Urban, is probably like a very specialized system for urban combat. I don't know how that will work. Maybe it detects buildings better or something. I don't know. But from the name, I would guess, I would assume it's a specific, specifically designed for urban combat. On the appearance front, the Urban Mech looks like an egg with legs and anthropomorphizes R2D2. I I said the word correctly, probably, maybe, I don't know. A stiff Zegok with no arms. A trash can with legs, which allows it to blend in with the cityscape, making it even harder to hit. Because uh, trash cans everywhere in the city. <laughs> no, but seriously though, it is actually hard to hit because of the small compact design of it. It gives the narrow profile quirk. Since it also doesn't have any arms, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit because there's something about it that's kind of weird. <laughs> Orgus offset this disability with an extended torso twisting mechanism. So you can twist not really 360, but almost 360. So, let's begin looking at all the variants that exist as of this recording. Let's start with the first one produced by Orgus Industries in 2675, the UMR60. The first version is equipped with an Imperator B AC10 on the right arm with 10 shots in the right torso, and a small laser on the left arm for anti-personnel purposes. This one will cost you 1.4 million. Then there's a sub variant of the R60 called the R50, which apparently is an armless variant. So this is what I'm talking about. Again, th th it's, it's called an armless variant in the TRO, which I don't really get because this thing is armless. So 
I, I guess this armless variant has his weapons in the middle, maybe? I'm not entirely sure, but the, 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 the urban mech is technically an armless mech, so... I'm not sure how this works. Maybe it's got weapons in the middle. Who knows? <laughs> and we don't even know what those weapons are because it was only mentioned in, like, a, te a text. Like, it wasn't, like, th there's no record sheet or anything. It was just mentioned in the TRO. In, you know, in the development or whatever it's called. And w one of the many texts that, 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 that's available on the page of the mech, I guess. It was also apparently considered a failure, so I guess that's why... Uh... It's not a thing that you can use, I guess, because... Well, it's probably useless. <laughs> but anyway, back to the variants. Almost 300 years later, they introduced the UMR-60L. Imagine that. Almost three centuries of the same thing. I mean, it's got a very specific use, so I guess it's not really much to change. This refit was developed by the Capellan Confederation by one of the companies, Hellespont Industrials. This one deletes two tons of armor to make way for an Imperator Zeta class AC-20 with five shots. That's not a lot of shots, but this is an AC-20. You don't need a lot of shots to kill something with it. Well, I guess it depends on the weight class, I guess. <laughs> the reduced armor and ammo count limited the mech's popularity, and the few that are still around are only seen in loud space. This will cost you about 1.5 million. In 3018, the Fed Sun's Phoenix Heavy Industries decided to throw in their hat in the urban mech market. They worked with Hammerstorm Electronics Corporation to create an urban mech for the open fields. The sub-urban mech. The UMR-90 is built upon the Phoenix UMR special chassis and is covered with 6 tons of Phoenix Curace, Curass, Curass, I think that's how you say it, Curass standard armor. It is powered by a DAV-90 engine which pushes the thing to 54 kilometers per hour and three Phoenix J-55 gem jets giving an extra 30 meters of distance, so 90 meters. A very big improvement. The weapon loadout is also improved. With a Hammerstorm HEC Firestorm PPC on the right arm, two Hammerstorm Mjolnir 5 medium lasers on the left torso and a Hammerstorm Mjolnir 3 small laser on the left arm. Targeting is helped with the Hammerstorm Union Mark VI system, and the communications are done with the Hammerstorm Hugen Mark Seven, Or is that eight? I don't know what number that is. <laughs> I guess, like, out of universe, you know, uh, they, they, they know how loved the Urban Mech is, but since it's very... I'm not saying useless, but it's very limited in its use. They made, like, a version that's more capable in the open field, so more people can use it without sacrificing a sacrificing bv i guess for a meme i guess maybe i'm not entirely sure <laughs> it's still a meme i guess in a way but maybe this one's a, a more capable meme maybe i don't know i've never used one for now but anyway this one will cost you 1.7 million there's also a cancel variant of the suburban mech called the umr 100 which was supposed to be even better it was supposed to come with an extra 0.5 tons of armor an extra jump jet and 10 double heat sinks. It was also powered by an even stronger DAV120 engine, giving it an extra 10 kilometers of speed, so 64. The PPC was replaced with an ER variant. The UMR100 would would have been a thing in universe, but the clan invasion happened, and the high cost also dissuaded its continued development. If it made it to production, it would cost 2.4 million, but. There is a record sheet for this thing, so I guess you could use it tabletop if you want to. Alright, back to the OG. The UMR-63. After the Fourth Succession War, the Confederation was in dire need of mechs. They had a lot of Urbies around doing garrison duty, so by 3050, they had Hellspawn, presumably, do a proper upgrade kit for the Urbies so that they could be somewhat used in uh, frontline combat. The mech on the whole remained similar to the original variant, except for its weapons. On the right arm, you have the Mindron XL LBX AC-10 with 10 slugs. Now you might ask, why bother with LBX if you're not going to put uh, cluster shells in it? Well, that's because the LBX has slightly more range. It's lighter and generates less heat. The weight savings allowed the installation of a Magna 200p small pulse laser on the left torso. This one costs about 1.7 million. 13 years later, the Free Worlds League yoinked the design and made some changes. The UMR-16 nice. comes with 5 tons of Kalen 
FWL Special Ferro Fibers Armor. They deleted a single heatsink and switched the AC-10 with a Mydron XL Ultra AC-10 with, you guessed it, 10 shots. Since the Ultra is a machine gun version of the Assault Cannon, this thing runs out of ammo quick. Other than that, you still have a small pulse laser and a small laser on the left arm. It's now an ER small. This one will cost you 2 million. Two years later, we go back a number. The UMR-68. It's a combined built variant. It switches out the LBX-10 with a Shingunga MRM-30 launcher of 16 shots. Apparently, Clan Ghost Bear got spooked by this when they first encountered this. This one causes 1.5 million. Then the next year, in 3066, the Davions made their own Irby. That's not a sub Irby. The UMR-70 mounts 6 tons of ferrofibrous. The LBX was switched from Mydron Tornado RAC-5, rotary AC-5, with 16 shots. The short pulse was switched out for an e ER medium, and the small was also switched out for an ER model. This one is 2.1 million. Then six years later, in 3072, the UMAIV was created. This is the nuclear Irby. They put an aerofoil launcher in the right torso of 10 shots in total. The normal loadout is five normal missiles and five homing missiles, but like any weapon system that fires something physical, you know, bullets or rockets or missiles, whatever, you can put special ammo in it, like a nuke. To make space for the launcher, one heat sink was removed. The cockpit is reduced to a small cockpit. The gyro and engine are both XL models, and the chassis is endo steel. Other than that, an ER medium is installed for personal defense. The nuke launcher will cost you 2.5 million. Four years later, in 3076, we have the UMR-80. A snub nose PPC replaces the AC-10 on the right arm. They also install a tag laser there. On the right torso, there is an active bagel probe giving the mech better scanners. On the left torso, there is a small pulse laser there with a Guardian ECM. The small laser on the left arm is still there. The jump jets were also upgraded to improve models giving the mech 90 meters of jumping distance. This one probably spots for the UMAIV because it looks like a scout model. So the, this one will, you know, go ahead, you know, tag the target and then the... Uh, the AIV will launch the nuke, I guess. <laughs> this one will cost you 2.3 million. In 3130, they went back with the numbering. The UMR-27 comes with three SRM-6s with 45 shots total. So this this has the most ammo out of every every uh, Irby. So this is probably the most useful one. Probably. Two on the right arm and one on the left arm. Also on both arms, the AES or Actuator Enhancement System is, is installed. The system basically makes you... I mean, it depends on where you install it, but if you install it in the arms, it makes you shoot better. It's more accurate. If you install it in the legs, I don't remember what happens. <laughs> anyway, uh, they had to delete one thing to fit all this, and this one costs us 1.7 million. In the same year, the Capellans hired Njord Wing. A mad lad who is devoted to the Irby to create a new variant. The UMR-93 was first encountered during the Capellan invasion of Prefecture 5, a space of planets that were captured from the Capellans during the Fourth Succession War. During the evacuation of Ningpo, Republic Guard forces tried to delay the Capellan advance by attacking two dropships of lances of hovercraft and at least one lance of fast Belmax. They expected to engage a well-entrenched force of infantry tanks, but instead were greeted with four urban mechs. They thought it would be a cakewalk, so they went all in. In the end, they lost three hovercraft and a spider, while all four urban mechs survived. The UMR-93 is equipped with 12 tons of hardened armor, which is exactly why they couldn't kill any. <laughs> this armor does affect speed though. It, slowing, it slows down this deep, slowed mech even more. Heat sinks will agree to 20 doubles. There's a plasma rifle on the right arm with 10 shots. On the left torso, there's an ER medium and an ER small on the left arm. This one will cost you 1.9 million. And finally, there is the UMR-96, introduced in 3149, another Njord variant. This mech comes with 11.5 tons of hardened armor and three improved jump jets. It is armed with a snub nose PPC and a small X-Pulse. This is still new and apparently hasn't been tested in the field yet. In universe. <laughs> the latest variant costs 2 million. 
There's also the Clan Urban Mech too, but that will be its own video. Hmm. That's not customs for the Urban Mech, which is surprising. So I guess we just move on to the less cannon ones. First, there's a version of the original, the UMR-60, with a machine gun instead of a small laser. They also deleted one of the heat sink to fit the ammo, which is uh, 100 shots. There's no record shit for this, so I have no idea if there's anything else, if they change anything else. Then from MWO, we have two. The first one is the UMK9K9. What a name. <laughs> this one seems to be some kind of police version for the Irby. It's got a little like, light bar on the top. <laughs> the chassis switched for an endo steel one and it comes with 10 double heat sinks to cool down its heavier loadout. A large laser on the left, two smalls in the middle, and an ultra AC5 with 20 shots on the right. I feel like this is a lot of firepower for a, a police version. But what do I know? Maybe criminals in this universe are something else. <laughs> And finally, we have the UMSC Street Cleaner, which is just a UMR60 with a skin. Used by the Capella Mafia Solaris Stable. Oh yeah, and there's also this thing, which is a... Uh... Yeah. Alright, pilot time, and there's a handful. Let's start with the guy I mentioned just now, Njord Wing. Originally from the Draconis Combine, Njord is believed to be behind the R94 and R96 series of Urban Mechs. He has his own Urban Mech he calls Frickle. Right now, he is currently working for the Capellan Federation. I feel like this guy is like the in-universe personification of like, die-hard Urban Mac fans. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the next pilots are the McAdam twins, Gina and Gregory. They were famously known for holding the line during a pirate raid on the planet Stein's Folly in 3022 in their sub-Urban Macs. Gina is known to be outgoing, while Gregory is more reserved. And apparently they talk to each other with their own secret language. Then we have Captain Evangeline Cantwell, a Federated Sun's raid on the planet Aldebaran, 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 well, however you say this, left both her parents dead. Seeking vengeance, Evangeline left university and joined the local Mech Warrior Academy. After graduating, she was first assigned to the home guard, to the local home guard, then later was transferred to the Preston's Lancers. And finally, she joined her old sister's command in the McGregor's Armored Scouts. Look at this, huh? The Davions, huh? They, 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 look at what they've done to this young woman, huh? She was in university learning to become God knows what. And then they killed her parents, and which set down her down a path of vengeance. And you call us Capellans the bad guy, huh? Unbelievable. <laughs> anyway. Next is someone called Kyrax, 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 one of those three. And she pilots, she actually pilots this one. She is a pirate from Centander 5. She wants to prove herself to Helma Velsek to join his raiding party. But she hasn't gotten any chance to do that, so instead she would practice with her Irby anytime she can. Now we have Gordon Stewart, a mech warrior from Chesterstern Reserve's Lothar's Facilier Unit. He refused promotion twice, wanting to stay with the urban defense lance. I guess he knows he's good at urban fighting and decided it's for the best that he stays there. Gordon was very outspoken when the Confederation signed a pact with the Combine. His superiors then moved into the Merrick border, hoping he would die there to shut him up. He didn't die. When the Fourth Secession War began, the pact fell apart since both Combine and Confederation didn't really help each other significantly. And after the war, Gordon left for the newly established Tikhonov Free Republic. Traitor! Next is Commander Patricia Wellesley, part of an urban defense unit of the St. Ives Armored Cavalry. Her defense of Melodar against a Davion raiding force actually got her tactics put into textbooks. She was considered weird by her peers because she collects teapots and reads weird things. I mean, I understand the reading part, but what's wrong with teapots? Then we have her grandson, Paul. He joined the same unit as his grandmother and quickly surpassed his grandmother's combat record while fighting off the CCAF and the Magistry during the St. Ives War. After the annexation of St. Ives, Paul served the St. Ives Lancers. Though he served dutifully, he never really trusted House Lao because Sun Tzu Lao apparently didn't care for civilian casualties. But that's just propaganda, I don't believe it. Sun Tzu Lao, the Chancellor Sun Tzu Lao, a very, very lovable man, he loves his people. And finally, we have Ringo Peterson, another pirate. He won his urban mech in a poker game, 
which he named Bessie. He scored big by raiding this poor planet called Randall's Regret and used that money to improve Bessie even more. Then in 3071, he scored even bigger when he heisted a bank at Hunar. He then spent six months partying before disappearing with his mech. The original run for the urban mech was entirely done by Orgus Industries, the creators of it. But after the complete destruction of the company in 2837 during the Second Succession War, no new urban mechs were produced. However, due to the limited capability of the mech, most of them were assigned to very real-line duties which spared them from destruction that affected literally everything else. Even with no production lines running, the urban mech was present for the entire Succession War era, especially within Laos space where they were successfully used in frontline urban operations. A well-known example was during the raid of Fort Lyons on Carver 5, where Merrick forces suffered heavy losses fighting Lao urban mechs that were supported by infantry and tanks, trying to steal some Atlas and Victor parts from a storage facility. The Capellans used the tried-and-true Irby tactic of taking pot shots before hiding between the buildings, and repeating the process over and over again. The Merricks did drive off the defenders, but they only made away with a fraction of the expected loot. Their presence in Capellan space was even more noticeable after the Fourth Succession War, where a lot were given upgrades and put to active frontline duties. Other houses took notice and also upgraded their stocks of herbies. It wasn't until the Jihad when Hellespawn Industrials started a new production run of the original urban mech to help bolster the weakened CCAF forces. The Davions, on the other hand, developed the sub-urban mech, which was actually developed not because of necessity or desperation, but as a distraction. When Hans Davion took over command of the Capella March military, the first thing he saw was just how bad the supply chain was. Then he noticed the units that were loyal to Michael Hazek Davion, who was the lord of the Capella March, were getting all the good stuff and had no problems with its supplies. Hans then asked for a replacement for Irby. Phoenix Heavy Industries partnered with Hammerstorm Electronics Corporation and came up with their sub Urban Mech. Seeing this as Hans's plot to overthrow him, Michael had his goons sabotage the whole process. While Michael was busy doing that, Hans faced a supply chain problem. Now, I'm not gonna lie, dude, I never noticed, I never knew how much of a Capellan mech this thing is. Like, we Capellans, huh? we use this mech quite extensively from the looks of it. <laughs> I mean, they did, they, they gave it the most upgrades and so all that, and they, and they were the ones who restarted production of urban mechs, so. This is a certified Capella mech. Yeah. <laughs> but personally, I've never used it. I never needed to use it, really. But I have faced it. And it's quite easy to kill, so... My view of it is not really that high, I guess. But, you know, my opinion might change once I finally get around recording, like, you know, the background footage when I play uh, Battletech or even Mech Warrior 5, maybe. Who knows, maybe it'll get better, or maybe it'll get worse. Legionary video last week, I was not expecting a lot from the Legionary uh, when, I, when I would play it. When I played it in the uh, Battletech background footage, but I didn't lose a single one. In in that battle I did, all of them were, 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 were alive by the end of it. So if I can do that with the Urban Mac, I mean I need to play at a, in an Urban uh, what do you call that map of course I don't think it will do good if I just play in like an open field so I need to use it uh, you know use it with its strength I guess use it what it's intended for which is city fighting so maybe maybe just maybe my opinion will change once I get to use it <laughs> but anyway that's the urban mech everybody's favorite walking trash can. thanks for joining everybody uh, the next lore video might be a faction overview. I'm, I'm gonna try to do a faction overview. I was asked to do a faction overview. I think in the Centurion video. Is it the Centurion video? What's one before that? I forget. I'm probably gonna do like a small one first, just so I can get my grips on this and how I'm supposed to do this. Uh, you know, the, the format and everything. So I might do a small one first. Or, again, you could recommend me a video if you want me, uh, if you want me to you want me to do a video, I guess you want me to do another Mac, you want me to do a tank, you want me to do the the Bulldog? Or you want me to do the uh, other Centurion, the, the, the flying variant, <laughs> the flying kind of Centurion? I'm all up for it. Just tell me, I'll get to it. I mean, this video was a recommendation by Christian. 
he wanted to know more about the Irby. Thus, I delivered. <laughs> but anyway, that's been that. That's been me. I have Discord. If you want to chat me off screen or whatever, see the posts, the memes I post. Or you can just follow me on Twitch. I'm almost at 100. By the time I record this, at least I'm, I'm like three away from 100. Say, so, hey, maybe you can help me with that, huh? <laughs> Other than that, that's been that. That's been me. Until next time, whenever that will be. Take care, everybody. And I'll see you then. See ya. Bye-bye.